Yeah, welcome back. It's still the run-up. Uh, the federal government yesterday denounced insinuations by Kaduna State Governor Malam El Rufai rather, that some fifth columnist in the State House Abuja were working to frustrate the victory of All Progressives Congress APC presidential candidate Bola Tinubu in the February 25, 2023 presidential election, adding that the president has consistently demonstrated his commitment to free, fair and credible elections. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, while reacting to the allegation, said the government was unaware of anyone within the presidential villa working against any candidate in the next month or this month's presidential poll. Are they infighting in the APC? Are they fifth columnists really as alleged by El Rufai? Well, we have to discuss uh, with us two chieftains of the All Progressives Congress. First of all, we have Barrister Felix Moka, National Publicity Secretary of the All Progressive Congress APC. Barista Moka, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We also have uh, Bayo Adedusu, Adedosu, member of the Stakeholders Relations Directorate of the PCC of APC and the Assistant Director of Diaspora Mobilization and Allied Matters of the Oyo State APC Campaign Council. Welcome to the program, Mr. Adedosu. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Let me just begin with you. Just explain to us what this your portfolio is, Stakeholders Relations Directorate, so that people who are watching us now will understand better. Because we've seen people uh, riding bikes and driving cars that is written the uh, brother to the chapter chairman of the party. So, so just get to explain to us what this portfolio of Stakeholders Relations Directorate is. Well, uh, thank you very much for that, for asking the question for clarification. Mm. Uh, but before I proceed, let me give due respect to my brother, my uncle, and my boss, Barrister Felix Moka, who is uh, a top chieftain. If you are calling anybody a chieftain, he's the one that deserves to be called a chieftain. <laughs> I'm just his errand boy, so I'm here to just give support to whatever he's here to do today. And I'm talking about the stakeholder relations. The stakeholder relations is actually one of the directorates in APC Campaign Council. And we have as its director, Malam Nuhuri Badu, and the Honorable Minister for Youth and Sports, Chief Sunday Dari, as the deputy director. So I'm just a member of the stakeholder relations. And as we, as we know, every Nigerian is a stakeholder in the scheme of things in the polity of the country. And as such, they need to be reached out to just like uh, our principal, Ashwa Jibola Metinubu, has been meeting with different stakeholder groups. That is the essence of having these stakeholder relations for us to be the forerunner, to reach out to these people, to let them know there is a need for them to come on board. There is a need for them to hear directly from our candidates. And we do the work ahead for our stakeholder because we need to identify all the different stakeholder groups as you are. You are a stakeholder apart from the fact that you are in the media you have a voice, you need to be heard, you have concerns, and that is why you see the different town hall meetings going on. That is what it's all about. Those, that is how we identify the stakeholders and Ashwa Jibola Metinubu meets with them. And I believe my, my Oga can let, let credence to that. Thank you. Okay, that means we have a high chief and a lower chief. So, but we all just know <laughs> that you have a uh, strong footing in the APC. So, uh, well, before the program, we were discussing with someone and uh, the person seemed a, a little bit confused with all the explanations that the person didn't know. So now stakeholders relations is interaction with those people who are stakeholders or that you see as stakeholders. We understand now and I hope whoever else uh, was confused understands because you cannot take anything for granted these days. Words or meanings are in people, not in words, as my lecturer used to say. Okay, let me come to you, Barrister Moka. Uh, the, the, the real issue we're discussing here is the fact that uh, there seem to be some cracks within the APC. <clears throat> First of all, um, the, 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 the presidential candidate of the APC said the redesign of the Naira and the fuel scarcity were targeted at him. Now, the governor of Kaduna State, Malam Nasir El Rufai, also said that the, there are people in the presidency that are working against the presidency of Ahmed Bola Tinubu. But the presidency itself, uh, you know, through the, the mouthpiece of the presidency, that is Lai Mohammed, the Minister of Information and Culture, 
has said that, no, there is nobody who is working against the presidency of Bola Ahmed Tinubu. We seem to be confused from the same party, speaking from two different sides of the mouth, as it were, as Africans will put it. Explain to us what is really going on in the APC. Are there fifth columnists or are there no fifth columnists before we address other issues? Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. And um, good to see you, my brother, Mr. Didoso. Um, there is no conflict uh, going on in our party. Now, what you've seen uh, unfolding is a normal part of the political season. You know, and it's not just in our party, it's in all the parties, and it's in all political parties, any and everywhere in the world. Now, when elections uh, are upon us as we have, you are bound to have people speaking out, people within the party and people outside the party. Now, don't forget that in government, the government is not populated exclusively by members or card carrying members of the party. You know, within the government, you have civil servants, you have individuals who are appointees and who are appointed sometimes in their own personal rights, based on their expertise or based on, you know, uh, the, the preferences of the appointor. So when people speak about uh, some individuals who may be acting outside of the, uh, the narrative or the script or the objectives of the party, they're not necessarily speaking about members of the party who are acting against the interests of the party. Sometimes, you know, individuals have their own preferences. They have their own biases and their own interests, and they take action and use their platforms and their opportunities or their powers to try to advance other conflicting objectives. Now, having said that, I think that the comments by, you know, our candidate, Asiwajibola Metinubu, are perfectly consistent with his role and with his own understanding of what needs to be. Now, don't forget that we, we this is about eight years of the administration of uh, Mr. President, and we haven't had anything close to what we're having right now when it comes to fuel scarcity. Now, fuel scarcity was the order of the day under the PDP before 2015. Now, any Nigerian who has been in this country will attest to the fact that we have not had any sort of protracted scarcity of petroleum products in this country. This government has been you know, very diligent and efficient in ensuring that we have consistent supply of petroleum products. So what we're seeing right now is out of the ordinary. It's out of character with what this government has done. So if our candidates, out of concern, genuine concern for Nigerians, for their welfare, uh, for their economic well-being and prosperity, is saying that all of those who have responsibility to ensure that petroleum products are made available as quickly as possible to end the scarcity. Now, that is what I expect a leader to do. What I expect an individual who has offered himself to serve in the highest office of the land to do. So he's doing exactly what I expect of him. And that's why some of us you know, have, very, have full confidence in his vision and his capacity uh, to lead this country. Same with the comments on uh, the scarcity of money. Now, I don't think our candidate is at all uh, suggesting that he's opposed necessarily to the policy to redesign our currency. What he's saying is that it should be done efficiently and it's urging the CBN and all of the other actors involved to ensure that as they have made this policy, they should implement it in a way that is efficient, that is quick and effective, and does not bring uh, any sort of you know, uh, untold you know, hardship to our people. Again, that is what I expect from a man who is aspiring to lead Nigeria's, you know, okay. I mean, the most populous uh, country uh, on our continent. Well, I, I, it's interesting because let me borrow the words of James Hadley Chase. You hold the four aces. APC holds the four aces. Everything about what is happening here is in the hands of the APC. Naira redesign, uh, the fuel scarcity and all that. You just said the PDP, in their time, it was the order of the day. And I don't want to believe that PDP has infiltrated the APC and taught them what to do or are taking over to do what they used to do in their time, if that is what you're insinuating. But how come, if there's a problem within the administration of APC, a chieftain of the APC will not pull the ropes behind, will come in 
front of everybody in public glare and say that this thing is targeted at him. In my opening, I said that someone used to say, and I like that quotation all the time, I use it, that words, meanings are in people, not in words. So people are prone to interpreting whatever is being said. And that's why we need to be careful what we say so that the misinterpretation would be as little as possible. Now he is saying this. Does it now mean that he is accusing people of his party? Because if he, if, he has to, if he has to bring a solution to it, it's not to come to tell us that this is what is happening. But he has said it already. How would you explain to the common man that it was not a cry for help? That look at these people, they're trying to sabotage my election. They're trying to sabotage my ambition. Explain to us the common men who are not part of the APC that need to understand. No, the, the, there's no difficulty with the comments made by Asiwaju Bolame Tinubu regarding fuel scarcity. Yes, Asiwaju is a member of APC. He's the flag bearer of our party for the office of president in the next election. And the president of the Federal Republic is the leader of our party. Now, Asiwaju Bolame Tinubu is not in government. He's an individual. He's a party man. He's a party leader. He's a candidate. But he is not in government. He does not have the instruments of governance. And he is campaigning to our people, to the electorate, saying to them, please vote me at the next election. But he's also keenly aware of the existential challenges that our people are facing with respect to the fuel scarcity. And don't forget what I said earlier. This has been out of character with you know, what has gone on in the life of this administration. Now, I think that to equate everything between the party and the government, you know, I think there's a subtle you know, difference that I'd like to emphasize, which is that, yes, the party in, we are the party in power, and the president is the leader of our party, of the government. But my point is that the government itself, the totality of government, is you know, broader than the party. Because you have people within the government who have all kinds of you know, uh, loyalties as well who have their own individual preferences, who will vote as they choose. Individuals who have just one vote will, you know, exercise their franchise the way they choose. All I'm saying is that what our presidential candidate did is that he had the courage to come out to say to, you know, the government and to everyone, I do not, you know, like what is going on. I think that this needs to be tackled expeditiously. I think it's actually a sign of you know, utmost maturity. He's showing leadership and maturity at its best to have the courage to speak to the government of which, you know, he's a member of the ruling, uh, you know, party to say, look, you know what, whatever okay. is going on, you need to quickly tackle this problem and bring relief to our people, especially given that we're faced with an election. And he has an interest in the election. So, you know what, I don't see any conflict at all in all the right. comments he made. Uh, okay, I, I understand where, where you're coming from, but it still sounds to, to some of us like a couple coming to the social media to tell themselves good morning, that they could have said inside the bedroom, um, or to quarrel on social media, something they could have ironed out in the bedroom. But let me go to Mr. Uh, Adedosu. We, let's try to take these issues around the, the candidate and the APC one after the other. For instance, it was said that during this campaign, the president will go with uh, the, the presidential candidate of APC to about 20 states. So far, we've not seen him go up to 10 states. And some people are beginning to say, it may not be true, but they're beginning to say that he may not actually be in 100% support of the presidential candidate of the APC. A lot of people are seeing the President Muhammad Buhari as someone who, at the 11th hour, is trying to leave a legacy of a free and fair election. And that might include also burning his own political candidate in his party. What is your re reaction to that? Uh, thank you very much. The first thing I'll say is there's a lot of media misrepresentation going on. And it's as if there's a convergence of, of media as a bandit, if I, can, if I can use that word, trying to insinuate, what, trying to bring to life what does not exist, trying to give life to what is not in place. We need to be mindful, we need to be very mindful of that. A lot of things are being said, are being interpreted wrongly. 
And that is not helping anybody. The media should understand its role in the country, particularly in a political situation like this, when we are close to an election. Let me first say that when we are talking about electionary campaign, the president has the duty and responsibility to run the country. That is his primary assignment. And I can, I'm very much aware that there are still many campaign activities, campaign events planned. Why are we so focused on how many campaign trips the president will undertake with, the, with our candidates? Is that the substance of the election? It is not the substance. Let us look, focus on the substance. If at the end of the day, the president is only able to do 10, let us give him the credit that is due to him because his primary role is to steer the affairs of this country. It is the same media that will turn around to say the president has abdicated his roles okay. as it relates to governance that is going about campaigning and you are going to accuse him of insensitivity to the plight of Nigerian if at this point in time he goes around campaigning. That is the misrepresentation I'm talking about. That is the misinformation I'm talking about. The media tried to look for something like, the, like my brother would say, would, uh, is, a, is a lawyer, they would say, you cannot put something on top of nothing. You are trying to put something on top of nothing. And a lot of the confusion we have out there today is due to the roles the media is playing today. The media can do better. But at the end of the day, it's like you're trying to bring two parties to war when there is no conflict. For you to be in a war, there must be a conflict. And there is no conflict in APC. So then don't let us misinterpret. The, the president has not done this much. The president has not done that much. In 2019, how many states did Article visit? As the, uh, as the presidential candidate. How many states? It did not go around 30, the 36 states of the Federation, yet Wari went around. Right now, if it is our candidate, Ashwajibola Ahmed Tinubu, that is not meeting up with his campaign commitment. That is where you have issues. And we have government officials, APC members in this government who are fully involved, who are going around with him. So what would you say what would be more important to you, showing leadership at, the, at, at, at governance level or showing leadership at party level? Which one is more important to Nigeria, to Nigerians? The, the Nigerians elected the president to lead them, making out time for the party activity, campaign activities is not the primary thing for him right now. But that notwithstanding, he is already listed as to where he will be. The campaign has not even wrapped up. You are already given a scorecard. On what basis is your, is your scorecard? On what basis is your criticism of where he's been and where he has not been? When electionary campaign will hold based on INEC timetable till February 23. That's what I'm saying. Don't put something on top of nothing. Okay. Don't let us bring people to war. As a matter of fact, a lot of misinformation, misconception out there today about APC is because of the media, media banditry that is that is going on. It's like there is a there, there, there is a there is a, an agenda to cause mayhem, to cause chaos within the APC structure by the media. And we know very well that some media they are not discharging their duties and responsibilities are impartial outlets for the people. They are taking position. It is, in this, it is only in today's media that we see a journalist to say, I don't agree with that. Or you can't tell me, I'm not buying that. That is how bad the media has gone today. And I will seriously suggest that let us tone it down. At the end of the day, Nigeria matters, not just politics. Okay, uh, well, every time that the media asks questions, um, a lot of people accuse the media that they're not doing their duty. And this exactly is the duty of the media. We've heard something in the streets. We bring it to the people who matter, answer the questions, no problems. Let the people say what they have to say. Let you say what you, give your own side of the story. That's what we do. That's what 
uh, the job of a counselor that we do, we don't hide. So we've heard this, what is your take? You have said this, we take it to, to back to the streets for them to do it. But a lot of time, times, people just say, the media is not doing their job. Go and investigate. This is part of the investigation. This is part of the giving the chance for people to talk their own side of the story. Now, we know from history <laughs> that abdicating the throne, as it were, leaving governance, as it were, has never been an issue to a president of Nigeria. In 2019, you said that even when Atiku, who was contesting, did not go around the country, the president, Mohamed Buhari, went around the 36 states of this country. How did he suddenly become so interested in governance that he couldn't go 10 places or 10 states with the uh, candidate of his party? <coughs> People will worry. It is not because of what Nigerians will call bad belly, but we need to know. Now you're saying there is no problem in the party. We take it. But let me go now to uh, uh, Barrister Moka. Both of you have said there is no problem in the APC. We would like to agree to that. We would like to believe that. But let's begin with uh, some of other, the other things that have happened within the party. We do know that the party came out at some point to say that one Najatu Mohammed was doing anti-party. That's why she was removed. But she said before that statement of the APC that she has found out that everything about your presidential candidate was a lie. And then she left. Now, not only did she leave, we've heard stories also that the Northern Elders Forum is spoiling for a fight, as it were, to pressure uh, the NNPP candidate, uh, that is Kwankwesu, to collapse his structures to join uh, forces with Atiku. So it has now become a matter of North and South, and the North are all out for Atiku. Maybe, that's allegedly, we don't know. Now, people are leaving your party. Some other people are organizing against your party for whatever reasons they are doing. What are the chances of your party, and especially your presidential candidate, in the next elections, starting with the one from the 25th of February? Our chances are as bright as can be. In a political season where you have an election uh, you know, upcoming, people come and go. People enter and they exit. Now, of course, that's one of the features of our democracy that we need to work on, that hopefully will evolve to a point where people have some kind of ideological commitment some principled commitment to the party and to its program. And, you know, help to, you know, if you will, sort of constrain what I call the revolving door, where people are APC in the morning and they're PDP in the evening, or they're PDP in the morning and they're APC in the evening. That's a feature of our democracy, where we are. It's not something that is about APC. So, you know, uh, Nadia too left, others come into the party. People are trooping into the party. As a matter of fact, if you want to take the statistics, I think we have more people coming into APC than are leaving APC. Look, you know, at the end of the day, people have a right to freedom of association. So when individuals come, and the others who join the party to actually achieve the outcome like, you know, uh, Nadia today, you come in just to, you know, be associated with the party so that when you leave, you can get headlines. But you know what? That's fine. She has one vote, and there are many more, millions and millions of people who are in the party who are also going to vote. Now, as for your point about, you know, um, uh, Atiku Abubakar, the candidate of the uh, PDP. Now, I don't think that in the history of this country, we've never had, you know, someone be as divisive as Atiku Abubakar. He is divisive, not just of his own party. This, this, is, not about, this is not about Atiku Abubakar. It's about the Northern Elders organizing against your party. Against your candidate. Well, it's not about Atiku Abubakar. Whether well, they give it to Atiku or anybody else, is why the, the, the fact that they are organizing against your candidate and against your party, that's why I'm concerned. I'm expressing concern about your chances. No, you will, you will let me answer the question as, as I see it. You have asked the question, you know, allow me to answer it. The point is that Atiku Abubakar emerged as candidate against the rotational principle of the constitution of his party. And as you know, 
that party today has been torn to pieces by his obsessive quest for power. Now, anyone who understands Nigeria and who understands the very fragile geopolitical relations we have in this country will appreciate what the APC did and what our Northern governors did in their insistence that power should rotate to the south of Nigeria, which is the reason, for the reason they threw their weight behind our candidate, Asuadibola Metinubu. You can't say that for the other party. Now, the point I'm making is that this country exists beyond the election. We are living in a very, very fragile moment in our political history and our political evolution. Now, I don't know what you're referring to about Northern elders, you know, uh, working against or, you know, uh, you know, coming together against our, our party. I don't, you know, know anything about that. And I don't, you know, buy that at all. That's your, you know, uh, summation of your understanding of what's going on. As far as we're concerned, our party and our candidate enjoys massive support across the length and breadth of Northern Nigeria. And we have good, good, good people in that region who understand the nature and the reason to stand with the rotational idea that guarantees our unity today and going forward tomorrow. So I don't think that they will collectively you know, do a thing or take steps to undermine the unity of this country, as you suggest. That, that's not something I'm willing to uh, you know, accept. I know they are smarter than that. They won't do what you are suggesting. And like my colleague said, my brother said, Look, I think we all need to tone this down. I think we should be having conversations about issues that are at stake in this election. We should be having debates about how to better the lot of Nigerians. All of these high-flying intrigues and suppositions and speculations and rumors and you know, innuendos, these things are not helping us. Now, the media, you have a right to ask any questions you need to ask, but I think that you must also bear allegiance to your calling, to your mission, which is to you know, focus on those things that will help to, you know, I mean, challenge all of our candidates. Because you know what, whether we like it or not, there are about four major contestants in this race. And one of them will emerge. Now, our confidence is that our candidate, Bola, you know, Ahmed Tinubu, will emerge the next president of Nigeria. But you or myself or, you know, anyone else outside of those four will not be the president. So it's important that we actually focus on them and ask what is it they bring in offer to governance in our country. This is not about, you know, whether somebody is making... Um, well, um, we, we were talking uh, with uh, Barista Moka before we lost audio. Uh, Barista Moka, are you there and still uh, with us? Barista Moka. Okay. Well, uh, I understand uh, Mr. Adedosu is here. Mr. Adedosu, are you with us? Very much here with you. Okay, um, well, you are one and the same. It's APC, so one question can go either ways. Uh, when Barista Moka was speaking, he talked about uh, how divisive the presidential candidate of the PDP was because he, against all odds, uh, emerged as the candidate for PDP uh, when they were supposed to have uh, selected a candidate from the South. Because he did that, he was very divisive. And he was also talking about the fact that right now we should be debating on things or issues that would be affecting Nigeria when the president's, uh, president rather, ascends the throne. Now, in the UK, for instance, okay, the, the British has a constitution that may not be as written and rigid as the one in Nigeria, which means sometimes, especially in politics and policy making, gentleman agreements are also as strong as something that is written down. Now, disagreements are rotation of power, presidency north, presidency south, it goes like that. Whether it is in the constitution or not, it is an agreement that was acceptable to the parties involved. Also, another thing that divides us is the fact of religion. Muslim, Muslim ticket is the bane of the APC as much as the PDP has a problem of the northern candidate when it should have been south. And here you are talking about 
divisibility or, or divisiveness rather, or unity. How do you think your, uh, your candidate of the APC is in a better footing, even with the baggage of the same, uh, same fate ticket that he's carrying? How do you think he is in a better standing than any <coughs> other political candidate that we have? Because yeah, people, the, the worry is that he brought a Muslim Muslim ticket and even the debates that we should be talking about, he refused to be in debates but chose to do his own town hall different from all the other things that people are doing. So how does he have a better standing than the rest? Uh, thank you very much. Let me take the last question first. When you're talking about, the, when you're try, trying to allude to the fact that our principal, our candidate, has refused to attend a debate. Who are the organizers of these debates? What are their antecedents? What is their background? What is the position of the media house that is organizing, uh, organizing this that people can see? Because when you want to have me on a program, like the debate that you talked about, and I see your disposition towards my person, towards my organization, or towards my party, I will excuse myself from giving life to your plans. Because we know the station you are trying to refer to, a station where APC is shouted down, is harassed, is, is bullied, and you want my candidates to grant them audience. A station that does not look at the polity wholesomely, but likes to isolate APC as the scapegoat or the dog that needs to be flogged. I don't believe you serve your meal to somebody who has made you an enemy. I don't think you do that. If we are talking about debates, let us have independent bodies to organize debates that is outside of the whims and caprices of any media organization. Can you hear me, sir? That is, the, that is, the, that is devoid of any political interest of a particular station. You asked me, so let me just finish it. No, 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 I, I, I quite agree. You can, you can go ahead. I'm just, I'm just trying to understand something. Do you presuppose that a station that hates, in quote, uh, your principal or your party could have asked him a question that he could not have answered? Because that otherwise... That is beyond the point. No, 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 no. Sorry, please. That is totally beyond the point. Don't let us mix things up. Okay? A, a, a media station that my, my, my other party members, my colleagues go to, and at every given time, it is like you are at a war front. It is a battle with them because that is a station that says, I'm not buying that. I don't believe that. Please, where is, where is impartiality? Tell me, media outlets, journalists are supposed to be impartial. They are supposed to inform. They are not supposed to be debating you. You are supposed to ask me questions and I answer. But the moment you tell me that I'm not buying that, I don't believe that, you have a position. And I'm not going to feed your position. I'm not going to feed your biases with my attention. That is the point we are missing. We are not asking, we are not saying debates are wrong. Or has it not been answering questions? This is what I said earlier about misrepresentation of facts, misinformation, and deliberate misconception. That's what I said earlier. And we need to move away from this. We need to talk about substance and not mundane things. I'll go to one of your other questions. Please bear it in mind that in Britain, they run a parliamentary system of government. And the leader of the country emerges from the party that has the highest number of people in the parliament. So what you, you, cannot equate, you cannot bring that in into a presidential system of government where there's an agreement between, within the party. There is no such thing in a parliamentary system of government. The leader of a party... Right now in APC, we have a leader that is the chairman of APC. 
the chairman of APC is not the head, is not the president of Nigeria, because we are not running a parliamentary system of government. People need to understand the different types of government that we have. That we have parliamentary system of government, we have presidential system of government. So in their own case. It is different. So you cannot equate this. Are you now saying there is no honor amongst men anymore? That even if the agreement was unwritten, that is not binding. What do we say about gentleman's agreement? I believe men should have honor, no matter what. One of the things I pride myself for, and I know uh, Mr. Mocha prides himself for, is honor, being bondable. That is what the, the, uh, the white people say, bond, are you bondable? When you say, are you bondable, they're not talking about financial bonds or anything. Are you trustworthy? Are you a man of honor? Are you a man of your words? That is what is being called, are you bondable? When they want to check, do a reference check on you, they want to know if you are bondable, if you are dependable, if you are reliable, if you are a man of your words. So that article jettisoning that gentleman's agreement is not something you should focus on. But you want to put APC's Muslim Muslim ticket under the radar, under your binoculars, under your state, under whatever to, to, Some to examine it. Let us focus on substance. Party parties are not in an election to win the position of the Pope or to become a general to become general overseers of a of a church. Parties are in place to win elections. And when you're talking about religious, the religion being divisive, being the, 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 the dividing us, we are the problem, not the religion. We are the ones with divisive, divisive rhetorics. We are, the pe we are the people who go on the altar. I'm a Christian for heaven's sake, but some of the things that I've seen are shaking me to my faith. And I, keep, I, I tell people these days, forget about the men of God. Find a path directly with your God. Don't submit your thinking faculty to any church because it's just a building. It's just a house. What you okay. need to do is to have them direct communion All with right. your God. Hold on. Let us, let us address this issue succinctly because the Fast media likes to talk so, so eloquent so about much us. about this Muslim Muslim ticket. APC is running and in an election to win the president to win the presidential uh, election and what is it going to win us the ticket and APC is, is in this same ticket that we have Bola Ahmed Tinubu who is married to a pastor to a pastor of a foremost church so if religion is not an issue in his house how will religion be an issue in the country and we all know that under Shetima, Senator Shetima, Kassim Shetima, as the governor of Borno State, he rehabilitated churches that were impacted by Boko Haram. How come religion was not an issue? It is not an issue because this is, this is the party that you, you think this Muslim Muslim ticket is a sure bet. Whether it is a Muslim Muslim ticket, it is a Muslim Christian it's ticket, you vote for who you vote for. Politics it's okay. is not about sentiment. All it right. is about numbers. Okay. Let's move away from that. All right. Um, there are a lot of things there. Um, I'm sure you know that when I was talking about the UK and all that, it was not about the comparing types of governments, presidential or parliamentary. It was about the strength of agreements, whether, whether written or unwritten. That's what we're talking about. And anything ha that has to do with PDP is not what we're discussing today. When the PDP people come to the studio, we're going to deal with them one-on-one -on -one the way we're dealing with you. So the issue of whether uh, we're biased or not will not arise. When the PDP comes, possibly they will say the same thing about us. But Sorry, let, let me just quickly take that Let me, on. Let me say this, because you're talking, you have, you have to, talked a lot. We need to you move to other, be very brief you about it. You brought the allusion, and I just addressed it. It's because you brought the allusion, and I will be doing the service to myself, to if my own here. It. I understand. If I did not address that. I clearly, That's what I said earlier. Don't put something on top of nothing. I clearly understand. Um, let, me, let me go to... Um, 
Barista Mocha, Barista Mocha right now. Um, your principle is because we're addressing his chances and the reasons why people will feel maybe his chances are slim. Uh, the seeming or alleged or perceived arrogance with which your principal is going about in his campaign is also worrisome. I'm saying alleged, I'm saying perceived, because it may, he may mean something else. For instance, when he went to Ogun State, before even he picked the ticket, we know what he said. But he just went to Akwaibom State, where he was given the logistics by the, uh, by the governor. Uh, he was in the stadium. Uh, in some states, I know that opposition party will not be given. And then he said, he described the governor as that boy that calls himself a governor that was living in my backyard. You know, words like that have made people to express concern that he may lose some votes that could have come to him because of those utterances. Can you explain a way why he makes these kinds of utterances? Look, on the campaign trail, everyone speaks and speaks sometimes not because he intends or means any disrespect to the governor mm. um, in that context. But, you know, it is on the campaign trail. People say things. I mean, you saw, you know, the characteristic display by Dino Melai in Asaba mm. where he was, you know, throwing himself on the ground. I mean, that, he was on the campaign trail. You know what? I, that was distasteful to me. But, you know, to him, he was, you know, trying to communicate uh, in his own very weird, bizarre way. Look, you know, on the campaign trail, people sing, they dance, and they throw out words. I think that Bola Ahmed Tinubu has respect for the person of the governor of, of Akwaibom State. And I think that, you know, uh, we all do. He's a human being, he's a person, uh, you know, and I'm sure he has respect for all of us as well. Look, my point is that that was not the only thing Asiwa just said, you know, on that stage. He said a lot of other things which the media are not reporting that should be the focus of our conversation and of any public discourse around the campaigns. I, I, look, I think the reason why you get the kind of feedback that you're getting from us and from, you know, I'm sure from even many Nigerians is that, you know, people expect more. You know, can we speak to some of the qualitative issues that are matters arising from these campaigns, from the manifestos of the parties, from the expressed vision of these candidates. Can we, can we have some thoughtful conversation about that? You know, but everywhere you go, in the last week I've been, you know, probably through nearly six, seven, you know, to 10 uh, media appearances. And all I have to respond to are, you know, issues of gaffes or what was said, what wasn't said. You know what, actually, you know, I find that to be a bit um, of a disservice to all of us because we can do more. There are some, you know, substantive issues that we need to be, you know, talking about. I, yes, I know, yes, as the media, you have a responsibility to discuss anything you choose. That's fine. I grant it to you. I'm a human rights lawyer. I'm a freedom, you know, I'm an advocate. So I respect your outer boundaries of freedom to, you know, articulate your, your positions and to, you know, ask questions. But you also should expect pushback when you ask questions that are sometimes don't, um, you know, really are not justified or to me don't meet the threshold of seriousness in the context of our you know, elections. But look, you know, nothing about our candidates is untoward. And I think that those who support our candidate who understand that this is a man of vision, somebody who has been in a saddle as governor of you know, perhaps the most prosperous state, uh, that is the fifth largest economy on the continent of Africa, richer than many, many countries on our continent who engineered that vision. Look at the Atlantic City, look at Lagos State, look at the prosperity despite the massive population of that state. See how the succession plan that this individual envisioned has carried Lagos to a point where you know, other states simply go to copy you know, models of development. I come from Delta State, where the vice presidential candidate of the PDP is governor. Now, his record is absolutely dismal, a complete disaster. Okay. You know, he's done it. And right. that legacy PDP there, is what they want to carry to the national you know, governance. You know what? Nigerians are descending. They are smart and nothing, okay. no amount of emphasis on gaffes or on what was said in Akwaibom will stop Nigerians who know 
you know, just, the quality of a candidate. Just one, one point, more question, because yes. the time is really up. You, you know, uh, but you have to understand that um, when a presidential candidate goes about campaigning, or any candidate for that matter goes about campaigning, it's not, it's not the good things that people will look out for. Because they will be looking out for a president who will be able to stand pressure, will be able to work under pressure, as they tell us in our, in our uh, acceptance letters to, to jobs. You know, can you work under pressure? Now, a campaign is almost like a pressure that you're working under. How will you thrive? So people will not come and say, Tinubu said he was going to build roads. That's not it. Even in relationships, is not the good parts that people look out for. It's that day that you maybe mistakenly slapped your wife that the media will carry, and then maybe the, the courts and everything will, will be on your case. So you no, expect these no, things. When, when I, when, when, when you should, expe you should expect these the things. Right now, no. another concern we have, another concern that people have, maybe both of you can talk about this, is that security in this nation is something that everybody is concerned about. And it was also, because I wasn't there, let me just say it was also rumored, it was alleged that sometimes not too far ago, a known terrorist was seen or was arrested in the house of your uh, deputy or your presidential vice presidential, um, the vice presidential candidate, sorry, of the APC. And people are also concerned whether that man can be a good person when it comes to solving security issues, having been perceived as someone who is romancing with terrorists. Give us an insight to what happened and why it happened and what the chances are. No, that, that, that's a comment that is absolutely uncalled for and unjustified, the question you're asking. Um, you know, to associate a vice presidential candidate with, with terrorism, you know, that, that, that shows, maybe you don't have Kabiru all the Kabiru Sokoto was the name have. on the, the media. Maybe you don't have all the information that you should have. This individual as governor is on record as being very forceful in his, you know, effort to deal decisively with Boko Haram. The record is there, you know, in public. You are, you are a journalist. You should be able to have access to all that information. So I, I think that to suggest, you know, any sort of uh, relationship or, you know, some kind of, you know, underdealings with, that, that, that's beyond the pale. That's, that's absolutely wrong. I really will, will reject that, you know, in its entirety. I, again, like I said, there are issues to focus on. My colleague did, you know, you know in his response earlier to you, he did, you know, refer to, this individual's role, the, the very valiant, you know, effort he made, you know, to, to rehabilitate churches and ensure that Christians, you know, in his state were protected against the attacks of, of terrorists. You know, I mean, how can he be promoting terror and be protecting, you know, victims of terror at the same time? Look, you know, these things don't happen like that. I think that the facts are out there for, you know, anyone who is interested, who is not simply looking for shortcuts. Uh, to 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 hate speech, to you know uh, to see the facts and to actually uh, understand the nature and the role that this individual has played and that he will play as vice president. He stands valiantly opposed to terror. He has you know strong experience and he understands. He was governor of a state that was in the eye of the storm, and he did well. No one has come with any assessment that is less than you know complimentary for his you know uh, service as governor under the worst period in a history of terror under the PDP. Okay. Um, now, it is the PDP as a government that failed to rein in Boko Haram at the early stages. We have pushed back. And, and today, you know, just a few months ago, yeah. I was interviewed almost every day about, you know, the wave of terror. Now, we're not talking about that now because this government and our military forces have, you know, been absolutely amazing in their consistent okay. fight Let's wrap to up, defeat please. terror. And we have pushed that now to the you know, remotest you know, uh, level. So I think we should sometimes be positive to acknowledge you know, successes as well. You know, this is our country, by the way, and I must say this. This is our country. Okay. We all owe a duty to ourselves and to our people to also sometimes run that flag of success where good has been done. In okay. all of this interview today, you have said nothing about the successes 
of our military, and it's not about the president. It's about our soldiers, our brothers and okay. sisters. Okay, let's wrap up, line. Mr. Mokka. We should also please. say to them, thank you for a job well done to our country. Okay, uh, well, uh, we have to know that... Uh, in, in addition to that... Please, if you just we have me, no time, sir. Uh, I, I'm sorry, sure... in, just give me a minute. I need to add something to okay. that. And okay, okay let me say this. Let me say this. We can give you some more time after the news so that you can wrap up the points that you have, if that's all right with you. I think one of the things that a lot of people are guilty of is illogic, illogical presentation of facts. Mm. When Kabiru Sokoto was arrested, he infiltrated the security at the residence of Senator, Shetim Kashi, uh, Senator Kashim Shetima. I wonder why it's not being reported that Kabiru Sokoto was in the process, was planning to kidnap family members of Senator Shetim, Kashim, Kashim Shetima. Why is that not in focus? With all, with all the power we want to believe Nigerian politicians, serving governors as governors have, do you think it's logical that if our vice presidential candidate was in Kahoot or in tandem with terrorism, working with terrorists or trying to shield them, he would have allowed the arrest of Kabiru Sokoto? We need to be a bit logical when we present facts. People need to reason beyond sentiment, beyond cock and bull stories. You know for a, for a fact that it was reported that Kabir Sokoto wanted to kidnap family members of Senator Shetima. Why is not that not in focus? Could it be not be that he was arrested because of, his, of, of having infiltrated the security at the residence of our vice presidential candidate to carry out his clandestine activity of a kidnap? Why must it be equated that he was arrested because he's having fraternity, is having uh, some kind of relationship with our vice presidential candidate? What has happened to the case of kidnapping that was in the, that, that was in the works? These are things that we need to put out there, that we need to situate beyond grandstanding. And that's why I said I would like to respond to this. And one of the things I think should, the media should try to focus on is INEC to ensure that INEC staff are not going to mess up this election. That INEC staff will allow the votes of the people to count. If some of if people have gone through the new electoral act, you will see that the polling officers have so much powers. The presiding officers have so much powers. They can instigate over voting at any polling unit if they are working with any political party. Knowing that it's a stronghold of a particular political party, they can work with the opposition to cause over voting, resulting to cancellation of the vote in that polling unit. Why that are we sounds, not focusing that on like that? You don't have faith in Why are we not focusing us? on issues that will encourage, that will strengthen our democracy? Yes. Why are we not focusing you, on the You sound like you don't have uh, uh, faith in the beavers. Those are the things we are trying to project. Not, not, not suppositions. Okay. Not allegedly. Okay. Not that suggested. Let us go into substance. Let All us right. talk about the action plan of our candidates, balance it against the action plans of the other candidates. That is what Nigerians need to know. What will transform their lives? What will move them forward? You said the media is not focused on the shortcoming, that the media picks... Not the media, the, the people, not the media. Not the time you rise. Not the that media, the people the are focused the on what the president will do under pressure, not the media. The media is telling you what the people said. So when people blame the media, it is what is on the streets that the media carries. They don't even make any suggestions. The people are saying this, whether right or wrong, what is your response? Today you have presented a perspective that 
Kabiru Sokoto, a lot of people may never have heard this, that Kabiru Sokoto was there to kidnap the family members of uh, Bonu the, State Governor. The, that is in the open. Uh -huh. so, in the open. so if it is there, uh, family members of the Bonu State Governor, I don't know if they live in Asokoro or they live in Medugri, uh, that's also going to need to be put what, out what there. What I would expect you to do is to fact check me. Let us be fact checking whether his family lives in the government house Abuja not, or they live in the Bonu State. Lives. It's not about where the family lives, it's about the intent of a crime. Okay, the family can be in Sokoto, the family can be in Abuja, the family can be split anywhere. Like me now, I have I'm not in Nigeria, I have family in Nigeria. Are you not saying because I'm not in Nigeria that my family cannot be kidnapped or somebody cannot make an attempt on my family? That I have because I'm a governor, I, I have to be always in the particular location. I, I get, location. I get your point. I get your point. Um, let, let me take a final one to uh, Mr. Mok, uh, Barista Moka. Um, okay, we're talking about the chances of APC, and uh, maybe there's also another perspective to what happened in Kanu and Katsina when the president went to visit. Because if it is not explained away, there's a possibility people might misinterpret it. It already, word on the street is that uh, because people are really, even in the north, tired with the administration of the APC, it might spell doom, uh, by that I mean in the election, for the APC. Because when the president went, there was some kind of riot, and the entourage of the president was pelted because of whatever reason. If you have an explanation or, or an insight to that, please let us know and wrap it up very quickly, please. No, the president's visit to Katsina and to Kano went very well. Okay. There were millions of people who attended all of those events yeah. in those locations. Now, on the fringe of the president's visit to Kano, you had some urchins who obviously clearly were instigated to put up that optics of a show to make it appear as if they, were, they had an axe to grind with the president. Now, don't forget, the president went to Kano to commission a lot of serious legacy projects, including a world-class cancer center. Now, is there anyone in Kano who will not be happy with those massive futuristic projects that were put down by the governor? and commissioned by the president. Is there anyone? You see, and don't forget, as soon as that event happened, of all the things that happened during that visit, the PDP, through their national public secretary, issued a statement in which they simply were crying on behalf of the APC, you know, sympathizing with the president and condoling the party on that incident. Now, if you read the text of the statement, you'll find revelations tell tale you know uh fingerprints of the pdp all over the organi organizing of those you know uh marginal uh you know sidekick of you know so-called uh you know protests by these uh, street urchins now if you see those who are throwing stones there's no significant it wasn't as if the people of kano were doing that and kano people everyone knows are exceptionally mature in their politics. But these street boys were simply commissioned by the PDP to do that. I issued a statement to this effect, and I actually called on our law enforcement authorities to investigate that party and its officials uh, in, in their role for this, because those acts amount to treasonable you know, uh, uh, you know, felonies if they're found to have been orchestrated by the PDP. You know, so look, you know, we are, we are in that late hour of our campaign. And I think that all the parties, we all need to take a deep breath and completely refocus our energies on exposing the issues that matter to our people, things that will help to challenge each of the candidates, not just the candidates of our party, but of all the parties, okay. to think right and to do right uh, you know, uh, during this period and set that example that our people need to see that those who have won their tickets to compete for power are mature enough and are ready to lead should they be elected. And you know what? I know and I'm confident that our visionary leader and candidate, as what you call Ametinubu, meets that you know, test, passes that muster, and I know that he will be the next president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria.
Okay, well, um, I'd like to take a memory verse that you have just given. All our leaders should think right and do right. That's what I'd like us to end this program with. We should never forget that. Whether you belong to any party, Nigeria is the overall party that we need to protect. And all of us should think right and do right. I'd like to thank you, Barrister Felix Moka, National Publicity Secretary of APC, for coming on this our program today. Thank you so much, thank sir. Thank you so much. And thank Mr. You. Bayo Adedosu, Member Stakeholders Relations Directorate of the APC PPC, PCC. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on this program. And for Thank you very much for having me. The, the perspectives you have given to whatever we were discussing here will have been very, very helpful. And we do hope that if we have any other great issues, we can call on you at any time for you to come and unravel ravel some of the mysteries behind some of the things that we hear or see. Good luck you to bet. your party. Thank you. Well. Okay, that's how we wrap it up on today's show. It's been wonderful having you stay with us. Tomorrow is another day, and God willing, we'll still be here. We hope that you'll join us too. My name is Nyam Gul Agaji. Bye for now.